Um, so I wanted to begin, actually, with um, really just framing, since this is the last presentation, I thought I'd spell it out for you really quick, clearly what I hope that you get out of my presentation. Um, and luckily for me, Richard, this morning, who I haven't had the opportunity to thank yet, um, set me up very well, because really what I want my takeaway message to be is the fact that we can create these new technologies, we can create these magic seeds, but without that behavioral component, they may or may not be adopted. So what BASIS is really trying to do is focus on that behavioral component and focus on the constraints or, you know, we've heard it framed in many different ways. Both of uh, Richard and Andy address this idea as well. But what is it that's preventing households from actually taking up the adoption or taking up the new technology? Um, and so one of, one of the things that BASIS is really doing is thinking explicitly about those economic constraints. Um, one of them being credit, um, another of them being insurance, um, and then there's, there's a whole plethora of constraints, but those are the primary ones that we are focused on at BASIS. Um, and today what I want to talk about is insurance. Um, so some potential impacts of insurance, there are, th are threefold, at least in terms of what I want to focus on today. Um, so the first thing is that when you give households access to insurance, it turns out that they're actually more likely to adopt these riskier technologies. So the technologies are often better, they're often higher returns, they're more profitable, but they tend to be slightly riskier. And so if you give people access to insurance, they may be more likely to adopt the technology. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And I'm gonna go through two examples of that. The second thing is that when you give households access to insurance, they have a better, they're able to protect their, both their assets, so their productive assets, their productive income generating um, assets, as well as their consumption, which has huge implications for nutrition, as we know here. Um, and so I'll talk about an example of that um, and some evidence that we have on that. And then the third idea with insurance um, is that it can also incentivize productive asset accumulation. So not only are they able to protect their assets, but there's evidence to suggest, um, and I'm gonna present some theoretical evidence, I guess, um, that households will accumulate assets more rapidly and more safely when they have access to insurance. Okay, so example one, cotton in Mali. Um, farmers in Mali report reducing financial risk exposure by diversification. So cotton is a higher return investment, but it also comes with higher levels of risk. And so what farmers will say is they'll say, well, I'm, I don't want to take that extra risk, so I'm going to grow less cotton, or I'll invest less in the productive inputs. We've talked a lot about packages here, right? And how we have this, we need to unbundle the package. Well, here it is. Farmers don't invest in the full package because they want to minimize their risk because risk is so important to them. Farmers in, in Mali do have access to credit, via group loans, but the problems are that the consequences of default can be really high. Um, joint liability itself from the group loans can actually discourage investment because if you do invest and you do have those higher returns, you can be you taxed on those returns by having to pay out your friend in the group. So that discourages investment. Um, so in other words, the real problem here is that that risk is keeping these farmers poorer than they maybe need to be, given the economic opportunities that are available. And so what one of the basis projects has shown, Hara El Abed et al, find that cotton insurance in Mali um, has actually expanded the area of cotton production by 20%. Cotton insurance in Mali has also increased input use by 10 to 20%. So there you have it, insurance increasing um, adoption of these higher yielding seeds. Dean Carlin et al. find similar things in Ghana. So they're looking at this trade-off between giving people access to insurance and also giving people access to higher levels of capital. Um, and what they find are the same things. Insurance increases the area that people plant in improved maize seeds. Insurance increases input use for those maize seeds. 
Um, and capital also increases input use. But furthermore, when you combine the capital with the insurance, you have an even higher level of area planted and a higher level input use um, by combining those two things. So alleviating both the capital constraints and the insurance constraints. Okay, so turning to some of my own research, um, looking at livestock insurance in Kenya. So in Kenya, and specifically in northern Kenya, pastoralists, um, the, the main livelihood is pastoralism, which means people are predominantly relying on livestock. Drought is their main risk. And what happens when there's a drought is basically households are forced to, between two options, neither is very good. One is to cut back on their consumption. The other is to sell off their assets. And keep in mind, these are their main productive assets, so when you sell off your assets, that's really limiting your future productivity. With consumption, you reduce your consumption, that's also limiting your future productivity if, you, if you're thinking about kids, the first 1,000 days, all of those kinds of things. So, brief tangent, how does a drought insurance for pastoralists work, or how does insurance of these kinds often work? Um, in this case, we have a research collaboration through Ilry, Cornell, Syracuse University, and the Basis Research Program at UC Davis. Um, but the insurance contract is an index-based contract. So what it does is it takes satellite-based NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So we get a picture like this. Unfortunately, the colors are not particularly great, but on the left side, we have a normal year, which is supposed to look pretty green. And on the right side, we have a drought year, which is supposed to look pretty yellow. So the NDVI picks that up, and we use it to predict the actual livestock mortality on the ground. Um, and provided that the index is strongly correlated with livestock mortality, which we've shown that it is, it should be a good way to cost-effectively provide insurance to pastoralists in this area, and also minimize the standard reasons why that insurance market fails. Um, those things being moral hazard and adverse selection. Um, so, brief timeline of events. Basically, what happened? Um, this line represents the NDVI in, NDVI over time, starting in 2009 to 2011. That bar there is average NDVI. So. 2009, 2010, we have above average conditions, and then for about a year plus, the conditions fell below average, and that resulted in the index being triggered and payouts being made. So there you have it, an insurance payout. Um, and what we show then is that with that payout, insured households were actually better able to smooth both their income and their assets. So this on the left-hand side here, I have two bars um, for insured and uninsured households, and that's looking at whether or not they cut back on the number of meals that they fed their families. And what we show is that insured households are much less likely to do that. So they're able to maintain their consumption, um, maintain nutrition for their households. Um, and in terms of a causal effect, we estimate that, that esti that's about 36 percentage points um, on average, and that impact is much larger for households who are most likely to smooth their consumption, um, or to smooth their assets. Sorry, so 27% less likely for reducing meals. And then on the right-hand side, we have the same comparison made for whether or not households are likely to sell their assets, and in this case, that's their livestock. Um, and we show that households are 36 percentage points less likely to sell their livestock when they have access to insurance. Okay, so the final point that I want to make is a much more theoretical point, and it probably takes about two hours to explain it well, so instead I'm going to try to do it in two slides by just pointing out the main intuition of what our model shows. And basically, what I have here is your beginning herd size, or your beginning asset levels on the x-axis, and your ending herd size, or your ending assets on the y-axis. And what our modeling shows, again, this is theoretical and we don't have empirical evidence of it right now, but our model basically shows that households, once they're insured, should see higher levels of productive assets um, in the long run. And what that means in terms of poverty is that 
not only will households be, have more productive assets, but they're also much less likely to fall into poverty. And that's partially because insurance acts as a safety net, and it's partially because households are accumulating assets um, in, a, in a stronger way or in a better way. So they have more assets, and they're also better able to protect those assets. And that's all I have. Thanks. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.